one thing I, 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 uh, I think is important is that health has been recognized as a fundamental human right. We have that across the board of anything that isn't common in rich countries. Um, it just isn't addressed. Welcome to the deep dives into the SDGs. Um, today we're looking at SDG number three, which is um, health and well-being um, with Lihi. Um, Lihi needs no introduction. She's the founder of Gita, and um, she can talk about the SDGs like no, one, no, no other. So that's why she's here, both reasons, of course. And um, so um, let's dive in um, headfirst um, into what is SDG number three? Um, what is health and well-being actually? What is happening in that field in uh, in the world and um, what um, is not happening what should be happening um as usual i give you the stage and um then we um, morph into a open conversation stage is yours thank you for the time thank you thomas uh and great to be here again indeed the sdgs are this uh, big 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 thing we deal with it's like all the problems problems of the world combined in 17 little boxes, uh, colorful boxes, but still, um, and generally tend to either make us feel um, completely insignificant or that make us feel that these boxes are insignificant. Um, but I think one of the biggest one to deal with is that green box right at the start, uh, which is called health and well-being. And as we did before, I'm gonna do a quick presentation, but of course this is a, more of a conversation uh, about how and if um, tech innovation can actually help us reach the SDGs. So we'll talk a little bit about what it is uh, and about cool stories, because really diving into this topic, you'll see we can talk about this for like hundreds of hours. Um, so we'll, we'll try to in the conversation and not talk for hundreds of hours. Um, <laughs> I'm guessing. Um, let's just try to. Ah, there it is. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so we're talking about good health and well being. Uh, green box number three. Uh, and we hope to understand it a bit and then uh, see if tech can make a difference and then also talk about some examples. Um, quick reminder, uh, whoever doesn't really uh, follow the first time we met uh, is welcome to jump back into that video. Uh, sure, we can drop it in, in the comments somewhere uh, where we really go into what are the SDGs, how they were born, um, and why this list of 17 objectives is actually much more impressive and important than it seems um, at first glance. And that um, since they came into play in late 2015, we have literally trillions of dollars uh, directed to, to these issues. So uh, uh, just a reminder, anyone who wants to talk about it or to think about more about the framework itself, we kind of talked about it in our first meeting. Uh, and so we have these SDGs, uh, these are all 17 of them. And they, again, they represent a whole story. And what's important to remember is that SDG three, just like all the rest of the SDGs, is not just a um, title or an empty slogan. What we have is actually targets and indicators um, to break that down. Um, what's interesting, I think, about good health or generally health um, in this space is that if you look at these 17 uh, topics, I think uh, health and well-being, well, let's just talk about health because well-being is just an ad addition, which is also an interesting point, um, is one of the first topics that we naturally or over the last hundred years or so use quantitative matrix to check if we're doing well. This is one of the first places where uh, that kind of methodology of measurement, even how many people died, how many people got sick, um, that basic, basic question, which is a quantitative indicator, 
um, that helps us check a social issue. Now, of course, when I talk about it in health, everyone's like, yeah, clearly we, we measure. You might notice that in all the other social issues what we talk about, measurement is, um, is a topic, is an issue, it's an even kind of a conflict. How do we measure equality? Can we measure equality uh, or education or sustainability? You'll have a lot of nonprofits say, you know, what we do, you can't measure. Um, and actually have this, there's a whole kind of movement of, uh, I'd call it uh, social uh, entrepreneurs against measurement. They're like, stop trying to measure us. We're doing something that is unquantifiable. Um, and yet in the health industry, no one is asking that question. Should we measure? Of course we should measure. Um, also health lies in the basis of what we call the good society. Um, before we talk about, you know, fulfilling ourselves or anything like that. And if any of you guys studied uh, philosophy or any kind of moral treaty on anything, the basic, basic, basic element is uh, the basic good is where we reduce unnecessary death and suffering. That is, you know, the, the afterwards we'll talk about what we should do and how we should live and if we should marry and if we should, how we should trade with each other. But the basic intuition of us trying to go through uh, civilizations and have progress is less people dying. Uh, less people dying and the majority of people die from disease. Um, and so less people dying from diseases or improving our health, increasing our life expectancy is considered one of the basic assumptions of quality of life. So um, not surprisingly, and we'll go over it in a minute, all these topics are deeply, deeply connected to health. Um, it's, it's really one of, we, we talked about no poverty being deeply interconnected, uh, but I think health is, is the biggest interconnected um, kind of SDG. Um, and in a way, it's such an established industry that a lot of people also get confused, you know, healthcare or the healthcare industry is so engaged in the private sector. They're like, this is not new. This is not exciting. It shouldn't be part of the SDGs. It's already kind of taken care of. And so we'll also discuss the difference between, you know, the mainstream kind of health tech uh, and medical devices and, you know, this industry that has nothing to do with the impact world. Um, and when it does. But yeah, if you'll talk to any entrepreneur or investor um, looking at health, they will be the first one to be comfortable with a measurement methodology. They will, they, the whole health industry, especially in industrialized countries and the rich countries of, of the EU and the US, everything is quantified. Every single activity is managed and measured and um, any kind of new solution is checked on its impact. So this impact assessment and impact analysis and all those methodologies is deeply ingrained in the health industry. And some would say um, it's kind of the inspiration or the kernel for measuring impact and all the rest of the industries where we, we find it a little bit more uncomfortable. Uh, so that's kind of one thing to remember. And yeah, um, let's talk about what it means. In, in this case, I didn't go over all the indicators, just the targets because there aren't much more uh, indicators. Also the indicators are, are kind of self-explanatory as we said now, um, once you see the target, you can imagine what we're going to measure, right? Uh, except one, which I'll talk about in a minute. So notice that there are nine key uh, targets, reduce uh, maternal mortality, and preventable death in newborns and under five children, um, and you know epidemics, uh, which are communicable diseases. So these are the kind of diseases that you can catch from someone else, uh, like uh, COVID. Um, and then the big thing is reduce non-communicable diseases. Those are actually in more developed societies, non-communicable communicable diseases, uh, or NCDs, as we like to call them are actually the majority of the causes of death. And these are heart failure, diabetes, any kind of chronic disease, cancer, something you did not catch from anyone else. 
something that your own body kind of manifested uh, from your genetic disposition or from your lifestyle. Um, and there is a lot of writing about the fact that in 1975, um, a big shift happened that more people died from NCDs than communicable diseases for the first time. So until 1975, our human civilization was very much uh, prone to being hurt and damaged and, and, and dying from external uh, kind of beings, uh, viruses and bacteria that we ingested and sent to someone else. And then as we developed and as we grew and as quality of life went up, that level went down. We found you know, medicine, antibiotics, vaccines, um, and the amount of people dying from stuff that we could prevent from choices in our lives or from being in our DNA um, has gone up. So that was a big you know, shift in the health world. And it also means a lot is going on. I want to point another point in 3.4, which is mental health and well-being. So reduced by one third premature mortality from non-communicable diseases through prevention and treatment, that I think is kind of, you know, the, the, the statement of any healthcare system in the world. Um, it's kind of obvious, right? Just trying to, to reduce the mortality. Uh, but promote mental health and well-being is actually in addition. So mental health is, until recently, it was not really considered steeped inside the healthcare uh, system. And that has changed recently. Uh, and we, we we're gonna talk a little bit about COVID and how it affected all of SDG3 and it did. Um, one of the big thing is that we are talking today about a mental health epidemic. And we realized that like the SDGs, all our body is interconnected. And so mental health is actually a huge indicator or kind of cause or supporting other diseases and uh, from our system that is very much focused on reducing mortality uh, and, and very much the physical health. From that commitment, we started seeing interest in mental health, knowing that mental health will actually affect uh, our physical health. And so we see more and more kind of issues going in. We also see a lot of advancement, in technology advancement, and understanding um, our, our neuro uh, pathways and why what's going on inside of us and what causes uh, mental disorders and mental health. And so that's a huge new issue coming up. And then well-being, uh, it's just one sentence. You'll see that in, despite the fact that good health and well-being is in you know, the title of SDG3, it is actually the only time it is mentioned is kind of at the end of the end of the sentence, of 3.4 um, because well-being is kind of a catchphrase of saying, in addition to trying to help people that are sick um, and you know, treat and, and, and cure whatever diseases we, we're kind of dealing with, well-being means let's make people who are not sick thrive. Let's see how we live a good life, not only a non-diseased life, Let's see how we enjoy living and not only not dying, uh, which I think is a huge step uh, for civilization to stop, start discussing that. Not just saying, how do we minimize suffering um, and, and preventable death, but how are we good? How are we, you know, well, well-being? Uh, so it's, it's kind of a new topic. Um, you'll see that there are not a lot of indicators around that. There's not as much knowledge that we'd like around there, uh, especially compared to how we deal with diseases. We don't know much yet, scientifically speaking, about how we deal with, you know, how do we create well-being. Um, and again, all of these issues are huge issues. Uh, so it's very hard to just talk about it for a minute. Uh, but I found it, and, and there was a, I, I will kind of share, there's a huge discussion uh, in the formulation of the SDGs about those, adding those extra two words, good health and well-being. Um, because there was just this movement coming in from healthcare practitioners going, 
we can't just um, look at, at the bad side, right? At the pathology, because then we come in too late. And real prevention is actually teaching humans to take care of themselves and be well and be happy and have a good life and not only a non-diseased life. Um, so that's, you know, a, a really interesting topic to explore. Um, and, and I'll give some examples later too. Uh, the rest of the issues we talk about are, you know, stuff we, we kind of know. Traffic accidents are a huge cause of death around the world. Uh, substance abuse um, across the board contributes to a lot of diseases, but also causes death. And then we have the last three um, in targets, which I think are really interesting. Um, so notice that at 3.7, we have ensuring universal access to sexual and reproductive health care services across the board, family planning, all this issue, it's considered under health. You'll also see this target under gender equality, um, but it is here. And that's an interesting point. And it's also kind of an ideological point that knowing about sexual reproduction is a health issue. And, and even though in many countries around the world, this issue is completely politicized. Uh, there are many residents in, in the richest country in the world, in the US, who do not have access to sexual reproductive health care. Um, this is something that is actually growing across the Western world. People have less and less access to that. So this is an, a really interesting issue that is put down here with the thinking of developing countries and incre increasing access. But we find out again that Sexual reproduction um, care is is really it's really considered something that is um, much more correlated to gender equality than it is to healthcare, um, and we'll see it blocked in countries like uh, Poland and in countries like Malawi uh, for similar reasons. So there is a very low correlation between wealth and access to sexual uh, reproduction and healthcare, which I think is the only issue here that has no correlation to income, which I think is also you know, interesting point. Uh, 3.8 is also very ambitious. Achieve universal health coverage. So this SDG says by 2030, we want the entire world to have access to healthcare. Um, this includes, you know, financial risk protection, access to quality healthcare services, access to safe, effective, quality, and affordable essential medicines and vaccines for all. Again, a very clear uh, point in terms of medical practitioners and healthcare pr practitioners, but anyone who's been in the world in the past two years know that this is actually a controversial and political issue. Um, access to vaccine, access to medicine, um, as the world kind of struggles with, with new crises, uh, this is considered sometimes a paternalistic approach, sometimes, um, yeah, like a, a science uh, kind of oppressive regime. So we're, <laughs> we're talking about reducing uh, suffering and death, and, and, and we find that these issues are definitely political. Um, and I think much more than, than other topics. And in, in a surprising manner, and, and, and I think COVID really exposed that across the world. Um, universal health coverage, again, is one of those things that it is a very much a government-based decision uh, and not so much, uh, most people don't really have this choice that they're just, just, uh, just you can affect it by voting. But this is generally um, related to social democratic regimes um, that 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 focus on universal health care, and we see around the world that this is something that is questioned. Um, so we can talk a lot about that, and we're going to talk about access quite a quite a lot as well. Um, and then the last issue it brings us together to how everything is interconnected and how fragile really we are as humans. Um, and all the climate issues that we talk about are closely, closely related to health. Um, and we don't have so many examples here. I think we'll talk about it more when we talk about uh, the environmental issues, but 
uh, microplastics are a huge issue in our clothes, in our water um, that are actually prone. I, I've seen somewhere that we, we ingest a few billion microplastics in our lives um, and that these do not disintegrate, do, do not fall apart and we carry them and they definitely are cancerous materials. And this has to do literally from the fossil fuel industry um, creating the byproduct of plastic that is now everywhere in our environment. Um, and that's just one, right? Um, Teflon uh, on, our, um, on our pots and pans. We have you know, chemicals in our groundwaters from, from agriculture. And we as humans are ingesting all of this and um, actually getting a lot of sicknesses and diseases that are unnecessary. So it all comes back to either communicable or non-communicable diseases. But then we see that our lifestyles, which have to do a lot with what we consume and how we consume and where we live, um, really affect the non-communicable diseases. And those are many times pushed by industry and companies you know, creating different materials. So, it's a, and it's a long list, uh, but really I think it covers a lot of the issues. Uh, we can talk about the stuff that aren't here, but I think there, there's a lot here. Um, I'll, I'll mention the last three, you know, I, if you remember from last time, there's always a few extra ones that didn't quite come in as, a, as key targets, but they're kind of additional targets, nice to have. Um, in this case, we're talking about, uh, you know, reducing tobacco, uh, support R&D for vaccines, um, you know, supporting healthcare workers, which is a big issue. And this issue of early rest, early warning risk reduction or basically prevention of disease is kind of written that almost as an afterthought, but I feel if there will be a, a third framework for the SDGs, we will be talking a lot about that as, as the world goes forward, um, about managing risks, about knowing and, 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 and sharing the you know, warning information. Okay, sorry, Thomas, that was a big intro. Uh, <laughs> Indeed, <clears throat> and it's um, it triggered a lot of um, um, thoughts more about the, the systemic issues um, that's, that's, um, that you touched upon, especially with the non-communicable uh, diseases um, and, and the rise of those. And in the same, in the same target, the, the mentioning, mention of mental health, which I think um, started um, being, um, or, or, or awareness was raised um, first time around the same time the SDGs were launched in 2015, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> that yeah. there is a mental health epidemic rolling towards us, which we are for sure in right now. Um, and, um, yeah. and definitely also propelled by, by COVID-19. <clears throat> but um, underlying um, all of this, or main, much, much of this, seems to me um, a misalignment of interests that um, that the that the that the market is not really interested in what what um, what we could call uh, salutogenesis, so the, the the practice and science around um, promoting that which makes and keeps you healthy, um, but rather um, on the on the um, opposite end, um, uh, focusing on uh, treating where you're ill, um, which which is interlinked with um, with the with the um, optimization uh, for consumerism in in for example the the food industry. Right. So we have biological um, markers for what we need to um, what what carries a lot of energy. Um, sugar and fat basically um, and so so that is being used by the food industry um, to, um, to 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 promote um, uh, mostly 
uh, um, uh, processed food. Yeah. So um, for those who don't know, there's um, incredible amounts of sugar in, in, your, in your pizza, for example. Um, yeah. uh, because that is um, what the tests show that this is, that this is what people like, right? Sugar and fat in your pizza, great. I love that too, um, but once in a while, right? Um, when our, when our um, right. ancestors had that amount of sugar and fat, they, um, they then took time to lay around for a while, um, uh, lazy um, integrating that. And then they went into uh, um, a, a, a portion of, uh, or time of probably um, uh, starvation or at least some deprivation, right? And <clears throat> so where I'm getting with uh, uh, or towards with this with this whole rant is um, if you if you look into the science of um, probably one of the best things to do to prevent cancer is to eat less or to eat in a in a different way. So um, practice um, intermittent fasting, for example, seems to be one of the strongest um, uh, supporters of. Um, staying healthy in, uh, when it comes to cancer. Um, <clears throat> and that is not really helpful, neither for the food industry, nor for the, for the, um, for the health industry, because you, if you don't get cancer, you cannot be cured and then, or treat it. <clears throat> and then that um, doesn't create any profits. <clears throat> so with all of that said, the real question is now, um, that's all being um, discussed, evident, and um, in my view, non-negotiable. <laughs> um, that we have to have to shift into a, um, a mode of salutogenesis um, away from healthcare. Um, is uh, where does tech come into this? Um, mm. So, what is what is the angle that um, that a tech startup could take? To, um, to disrupt those markets in the way that actually solves those things at the root um, and not in some, some symptomatic fashion? Well, I'm going to give you some ideas. Okay. Um, yeah. Go ahead. But first, uh, a little bit more context uh, yeah. because context is king. Um, so first we wanted to know you know, we had these these numbers, um, and I kind of wanted to remind you the numbers. You know, uh, reduce the global mater maternal mortality ratio, right? What what are we talking about? How many women die at birth, right? For anyone living in a, a post industrial society, it seems very rare. In developing countries, it's much less rare. So this is a, and and I do encourage anyone who cares about this issue uh, to, to check this out. The Indian government has an incredible kind of system of progress uh, where all the Indian states um, constantly are bringing in data on how they are showing up in terms of the SDGs. Uh, and so uh, this is one of their key issues. Um, what I thought was interesting is, you know, they show us, this is a global number. So 5.4 million children uh, die uh, before they reach the age of five across the world. And the large majority of this is in developing countries and in um, for reasons that are preventable. So completely preventable. This is kids who didn't have access to nutrition, access to water, or access to um, a vaccine. And so this has been a, a key topic uh, for me throughout this, uh, the COVID pandemic, because people are like, oh, vaccines are awful. I'm like, well, let's talk about that. Um, so we have to remember that in terms of health, we are living in several different universes. And the, that key question of access to health, or access to healthcare is huge. Um, anyone who's gone through a period where they did not have access to healthcare, even for a couple of weeks, and just, you know, hoping they won't fall <laughs> or they won't, you know, encounter someone who's sick. Uh, because if they do, there really isn't anything out there. And we have 
about 40% of the world population living with zero access to healthcare. So they do not have it at all. Um, and there's another 25% that have, you know, some access to healthcare. So maybe there is a hospital I can go to. It's 500 kilometers away, but I can go there. That means some access to healthcare. When, and when we talk about no access to healthcare, it's above 500 kilometers. That's what we consider no access to healthcare. Um, of course, this affects you know women or or dis, um, uh, disadvantaged population more. And I think there's a lot to talk here about the numbers, right? And and we have to remember that the SDG framework is very focused on measurement. Um, and here we just see India. Uh, we could go over other uh, countries, but it's it's incredible, right? So we have. Uh, 47 million children in India, in India alone uh, that are stunted, uh, which is, has a huge effect on their future health uh, perspective and their life expectancy. Um, and uh, we, can, we can talk about all, all these different issues. So the situation is not great, um, but um, it, it is getting better. One thing I wanted to show you again, and this just has nothing to do with the health issue, um, we can talk about progress, uh, but one of the key issues that we need to know is that um, according to all the data we have, the pandemic has uh, halted or reversed most of the advances that happened in the health issues over the last 10 years. Um, so a lot more people died of communicable diseases, clearly, uh, but also the whole system put such a strain on existing um, healthcare systems, which mean everybody got less quality healthcare, regardless of what they came in for. Uh, when you have doctors and nurses and community health workers just completely strained um, and no, no money in the system, then even the stuff that they were doing that had to do with AIDS or with measles or something like that, got less attention, the funding got uh, cut, and um, it's actually a really worrying uh, kind of issue that we're seeing kind of a spike up in a lot of stuff that already went down. Mm. I also wanted to share with you- uh, Just just, just, as, to, just yeah. avoid confusion, this is SDG, SDG three, right? Um, because the title here says SDG yeah. one. Um, oh, that's true, but it's great. Just for, just for those who are watching the screen, uh, don't be confused. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, uh, yes, it's SDG3, this is how it is. Sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, we're talking a little bit about progress uh, and what we saw that one of the key issues that happened over the pandemic uh, and, and yeah, we can't escape talk about COVID, we talk about health, is the, the challenge in capacity in healthcare workers. Um, that are generally overworked, underpaid, and lack capacity around the world. And this is everywhere, actually. Um, that we can talk about the scale, how underpaid and how overworked they are. Uh, but really, we're talking about um, the people that, that are supposed to help us get to these targets are just not there. And if they are there, they are being treated poorly. Um, and I think one of the things that COVID kind of brought up is a little bit is attention to that, uh, that we will not have good health without having a proper um, support system for healthcare workers. It's just impossible when technology can do a lot, but there are human beings that are essential in this process. And this is similar to the education system. And we'll talk about that as well, that there are a lot of stuff that technology can do and capital or business could do, but real healthcare or real solutions have to do, and when we talk about health, have to do with human beings. Um, and technology can facilitate whoever works in it, but cannot replace them. Uh, there is judgment here. There, there's a lot of stuff that human beings can do that machines still cannot do that have to do with health. Um, and we have to make sure that we are um, enabling those humans that are giving us the healthcare and not forgetting that they are a key thing. So that's that's kind of a whew, 
a lot to talk about, uh, but one thing I wanted to do, which I think is a lot of fun, is to show you guys if anyone cares about progress. Uh, this is a really fun website. Uh, well, fun. It's called SEG Tracker. Uh, you can go through all the SEGs, and you can see a little video of what happened. You know, um, you can also break down. It's it's from um, World Bank data, uh, and you we can go through all the different kinds of indicators that are behind those larger targets. So. 3.12 um, in order to get to 3.1, which is less death, maternity uh, related death, we'll have these sub indicators that we measure. Um, note that if we don't have the data, then it's kind of great. And one of the things that came up around the world is that see how much more data we have um, and how things are getting better. So I thought this is one of the most uh, inspiring one from 1960. Uh, this is child mortality rate, and uh, we can see it really drop. And guys, guess why? It has to do with vaccines. <laughs> um, so this is uh, incredible, really. Uh, and, and we can really see the progress over time. And anyone who gets a little despaired about the health situations, you should you know, watch, watch these little videos and see how bad things were and how um, we are making progress. So that's a little side note, uh, a, little, a little tracker to if you care about the SDGs. Um, cool, so. Sorry. Yeah. So um, um, uh, you, have, you have more. We're going right? okay, into then, business, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's, yeah, yeah. let's, let's, uh, let's, let's get to business. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, let's I don't get want to business, right? You go, you go, so, you go. Yeah. Um, one thing I, 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 uh, I think is important is that health has been recognized as a fundamental human right, which we don't necessarily think of it as a human right, uh, but it has been declared as a human right. It means that um, this is the kind of thing that we actually have laws to protect us from. Uh, but we mentioned in the beginning how interconnected health is, which makes it all the more complex. So if we look at every one of the SDGs has a direct impact on our health. And we can, it could be uh, either way that the, the problem has an expression in the health or health has a bigger expression in this program, program right? So we can look at gender equality and we can say uh, women in general uh, have less access to healthcare they die more from uh, preventable diseases, they have less access to mental health care, and they have just everything is, is more um, prominent. Uh, we talk about maternity death. Um, so, and all these issues we can talk about interconnectedness because really health is, is this basic thing of us being alive. Um, and so all levels of human activity have a direct relationship to our health. Of course, clean water, um, our education, our health, all of it. So this is really one of the most interconnected ones. Uh, and you'll rarely see anyone dealing with anything that has to do with humans and can't say, oh, but I, I also have to do with SDG3. Um, and in all fairness, they will be right. And so let's, before we talk about tech, let's talk about business because uh, really there is, um, there is a lot where business is deeply, deeply, deeply engaged already in the health world. Um, unlike the other topics that we, we, we may or may not discuss, uh, this issue is much more of an economy. There is the estimate of the healthcare industry is about $12 trillion a year. Um, not a surprise that the majority of that is in the US and, and Europe, uh, but it, it really is a giant number. And we also talk about the potential for the healthcare uh, or the private sector to really support getting the SDGs. And here is where we have to kind of distinguish between, you know, being private sector and being active in the healthcare and promoting the SDGs. Because what we find out is that the majority of the private sector activity uh, goes to very small numbers of issues that are really well noted and are really a big problem in developing in developed markets. So 
we can talk about more money going into um, sexual dysfunction in, in men than to malaria, which kills 20 million people a year. Um, so really, the, the, if we just let the private sector enter, we won't really achieve the SDGs, which is like universal health care, reducing the amount of people dying from non-communicable communicable diseases. Uh, what we find is that the private sector goes as it does uh, to where there is more money. Um, and we have to really distinguish when we talk about the healthcare industry, who is supporting the SDG and who is, you know, nice, but not really relevant. Um, and all of these issues have been identified as, as issues. This is from a really interesting Deloitte uh, report on healthcare and the SDGs, which is interesting that they, they do that. Um, but really we're starting to look at where, where can we really look at um, tech and business going into the space? So let's talk about that. Just in general terms, my key point is access. And access is a, is a word we use a, a lot, but we don't really always understand it. So first of all, access means you kind of, it's something that's available if you want it. It's not, you know, shoved down your throat. It doesn't mean you have it. It means you can have it if you want it, which is a, definitely in healthcare is a big, is a big difference. Uh, and so we break it apart uh, to four key issues when we talk about access and all of them have a tech, uh, a big, big tech uh, potential here. So first of all, the affordability. I can access something if I can actually buy it one day, right? If it's way too expensive, I can't buy it. And what we see is, is a lot of, and it, it was really hard to do this one because there's so much going on in this space. So I'll give a little example. Um, but if we can um, reduce the cost of, of something, then it's more affordable and then more people have access to it. And that could mean, uh, and, and that's where really technology comes into, into the play. It can um, allow us to, from an MRI uh, being smaller and cheaper, um, which is, you know, through hospitals and, and big procurement, to little stuff we have at home, uh, little tests we can do at home. We all probably took a PCR or antigen tests at home. That means we have access to a diagnosis uh, and we have access to the care that is required. And so as we see improvements and efficiencies in um, uh, the medical devices that we use that can be accessible to more people, we can see uh, it be the, the cost going down significantly. Um, Second thing is point of care diagnostics, which is actually kind of what I mentioned now was, was a different kind of test we could do at home. Um, think how data-based healthcare is. Like nobody can do anything without diagnosing you first. And nobody can do any of that real diagnosis without tests, without actual no, actually knowing what's going on, what's going on in your blood or in your blood pressure, or if you have this disease, if you don't have this disease, you have this problem, you don't have this problem. And for a very long time, these kind of tests and the process that they had, which is you have to go to a clinic and someone that has been trained has to take the test and then send it to a lab. And that lab has to be, you know, functioning and have electricity and, you know, have people working there. And then they send the lab, the lab results back to your doctor. And then you, you get back to that. All that is a very, very complicated kind of value chain in the story of healthcare that has been reduced significantly. So um, I know this, I haven't found it a verified number, but the stories uh, that I've heard when I lived in Africa is that um, it was quite common. They were 20% of, of people who had malaria died uh, because that diagnostic of, you know, do I have malaria, don't I have malaria, et cetera, took so long. Uh, that if you had that dangerous uh, strain of malaria that hits your brain, it was too late. Um, and that completely changed in 2012 when they developed this point of care diagnostic. Point of care diagnostic means it could be in the pharmacy or it could be at home. You don't actually have to go to the clinic. So if in the pharmacy, like a little blood test um, that within seconds, you know, if you have malaria and the pharmacist can sell you a medicine for it and you reduce it to seconds. So that 
really increases access. Um, and that is across the board. We've seen point of care diagnostics in, you know, I mean, most people know it through um, pregnancy tests, but of course throughout uh, the COVID people have seen these as well. Uh, but we have uh, diabetics having point of, you know, very quick testing at home, knowing what's going on with their sugar level. Um, and, and we have it across every disease that basically we can diagnose the situation and get the data we need. So that's a big place of innovation. Um, any kind of disease, any kind of health issue, including mental health, which we'll talk about in a bit, is now going into point of care diagnostics. Um, I'll also mention that this is going on with not necessarily in the pharmaceutical or self-diagnostic. We see doctors um, in areas that are more remote. There's an issue with specializations, right? You know, if you have a, a small clinic, the chances of you have like a, a gynecologist and a pediatrician and um, um, oncologist and all the different medicines that you need are very small. That means you have just a general practitioner that's supposed to kind of take care of you um, but through different tech innovation I can talk about this really cool company um, that are called OBM uh, diagnostics so they in in their cell phone right they created an overlay that any phone can be connected to uh, that really 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 increases the, the camera um, and the quality of it and every practitioner, even a nurse, uh, can conduct a cervical cancer uh, test, um, which cervical cancer is considered the most easily detected and most treated cancer in the world. And that's why most women have a pap smear test every, every year because it's very clear uh, and it's very easy to detect, but you need to get tested. So. That's only if you have a lab and a gynecologist that you can go to once a year, you know, all these basic uh, assumptions to have that. So they do it at anyone through a photo can basically upload that photo into this giant um, database of um, AI um, assessed pictures and can tell you right away if you have cervical cancer without even doing the tests and taking care of it at, at, the, at the clinic. So this kind of thing, if it's implemented around the world, uh, we're saving the lives of uh, 20 million women. Um, so that's, you know, we have all kinds of technologies there in point of care diagnostics. It's not only the kind of little cool stuff we can do alone. Um, it's also for the doctors themselves that, that can actually diagnose and treat right at, at, at that point. Um, one more uh, ish, solution for orphan dis issues, orphan, orphan diseases, or orphan uh, situations are basically um, the kind of diseases that either don't exist in, um, in populations that are rich enough or are not uh, very common. And so there is no funding around them um, to make them less. A big one is the dengue virus. Uh, dengue virus only exists in Central America. Uh, Thomas, maybe you're more familiar with it than, than others. Um, but around 500 million people a year get it. Um, and it is not a great virus. Um, it depends where you are, but the pr proportion of people die from dengue virus. And no one has ever bothered to create a vaccine for it. Even though it's quite a simple virus, uh, it is possible to create a vaccine. But because, you know, it's people in, it's just 500 million people, <laughs> right? But in, the um, right in the center of the world, the tropics of the world, where they're usually not very rich countries, then no one no one is bothered to finance the research around um, dengue virus. And we have that across the board of anything that isn't common in rich countries, um, it just isn't addressed. And so when we talk about universal healthcare and reducing communicable disease, it, we really, really want to look at um, this kind of issue of equity and you know it's not it's not fair that you won't have any treatment just because the, the disease you happen to have is rare um, and and to make sure that there's equity and justice in this space as well um, and then the third is access to knowledge 
right? So if we talked about reproductive health, a lot of it is access to knowledge, um, mental health, and, and a lot of the different issues uh, we talked about or, or communicable diseases, but you just mentioned Thomas, you know, what we eat, how we eat, this is about knowledge. Uh, this is not about, about treatment. This is not even about diagnosis. It's not about getting to a clinic. It's just being able to have access to the basic health knowledge that the scientific community already has established. Um, and here, of course, uh, well, we see issues as well. Uh, but um, of course, we know that you know tech or digital solutions have increased that access to knowledge in a huge way. Um, some would say in a problematic way. Uh, you know, the whole internet diagnostics uh, problems and WebMD being kind of the the doctor for the world. Uh, but most healthcare practitioners agree that this is despite the problems that it brings, it is definitely progress uh, that people know much more how, you know, they have an infection, they can look at pictures, is this, you know, is this good, is this bad? Um, and uh, I don't know, but I would love to see the number of how many people die a year just because of lack of knowledge. Um, one more uh, key uh, company I know, which is they're called Two Care. Um, so to care, uh, really have a vaccine, um, sorry, they were founded by an entrepreneur looking to, to find out if vaccines are indeed uh, problematic for his infant child uh, because of the hype around it. And what he found is that there are different kinds of medical research in the world. Uh, and the kinds that are um, peer reviewed are actually in a different status and they're much more complex and they're harder to read. But when we search on Google, we don't actually know the distinction. We just see an article or a research funded by um, a pharmaceutical company. And we also see research that is actually peer reviewed and checked and double checked. And, and, and as kind of layman, we don't know how to do that. So he created this website where you can, where it only searches peer reviewed medical knowledge. Um, so under this, this question of knowledge, we can definitely kind of segment that and have a lot of innovations that will increase knowledge. Uh, and those are just anecdotes. Uh, I have a few more that are here. Um, I'll go over quickly just because most of these guys I know, uh, I, I found that it, it might not be fair, but you know, there's so, so much going on here that I'll just pick, uh, pick and choose based on uh, companies I actually know. So Jamaya Nafa, uh, I'm probably saying it wrong, but this is, uh, this is a really interesting innovation in Zanzibar where through an app um, that is, is really accessible and really simple and also works on feature phones or dumb phones, so, uh, we can have self-diagnostic on mental health. Um, and if you have these diagnostics that score up, the the community health workers or different kind of mental health supporters um, offer right away to show up in your house within an hour. So you have this wide network of people kind of keeping an eye on each other um, and helping each other out. And there is this system um, that is very much local community based to make sure that if someone is kind of showing any kind of signs of really severe mental health issues, there is support even in terms of just someone to talk to or someone else to check that these, that these symptoms are going on almost immediately. And that that person doesn't have to go anywhere, which is a big issue. People have to go ask for treatment. And with mental health, we find that's a big inhibitor of actual getting treatment. Um, so this is going on in Zanzibar. It's the first, um, mental health digital system in the world implemented by um, the Ministry of Health. Uh, surprising to some of us to think, wow, like in an African island, uh, this is the first place it's going on. But actually Zanzibar um, has a very high numbers of suicide. Um, I didn't go over it before, but uh, in that tracker kind of video that we can see the progress over the years, you'll see that uh, suicide rates are actually very high in developing countries. Um, and it's kind of an epidemic that we don't really address because we talk about child mortality and you know, preventable diseases, uh, but mental health is a real big issue. So I really like this, this, this app. 
uh, I you know recommend you to check it. it I think it's, it's super interesting and it has already a cool result. It was implemented around 2020. Um, another one in Africa, and again, sorry, this is just uh, my experience speaking. I have uh, a little more experience in, in developing countries. Um, Ebola. Ebola in Nigeria and all over uh, West Africa, so in Mali and Ghana, uh, you know, when we talk about scary viruses, I think Ebola, <laughs> Ebola takes the win. Um, it is terrifying, right? It is the kind of virus that you see in movies about viruses that will destroy the world. Uh, um, you know, within three days, you have blood coming out of all your orphans. It's, it's awful uh, and very, very deadly. Um, and until and had there was several ab outbreaks in the last uh, basically 30 years that were quite uh, horrific in terms of the people it, basically anyone who got exposed to was, was killed and it, it moved very quickly um, what they did in Nigeria is um, implement this very quick tracking system that some of us uh, based on where you were during COVID kind of seen that the minute you you were uh, exposed to someone uh, through your phone, you know, and anyone in your GPS uh, kind of um, proximity, then you got a notification that you may be exposed and you have to be quarantined immediately. Now, that whole tracking thing that we, like we, I mean, the world kind of adopted very quickly during COVID was actually developed uh, during the Ebola crisis and managed to reduce mortality uh, compared to the Congo out outbreak by 72% uh, because of this quick action and quarantine. I mean, with COVID, we had a lot of questions of, of privacy about this tracking um, and, and how deep uh, we want, you know, the health systems to know where we are and who we contacted and how we should be in quarantine. Um, in a virus like Ebola, nobody was arguing about that. You know, that's uh, you need to be quarantined immediately. And if you happen to go through a village and that village, you know, a few hours later, we found a infected person there, then you need to be quarantined uh, or else you, where you're going, you're passing the, the, the virus. Um, so I think that was one of the first, uh, first implementations of, of wide, um, um, widespread pandemic. Oh, well, that was an epidemic uh, where technology innovation and the fact that we're all connected and we all are on mobile phones really took into place. Um, okay, I won't go through all these different issues. Um, I, I'll mention seeing vaccine because I think they're very cool and in the vaccine space. Um, and they are uh, a whole part of a whole group of technologies that helped create uh, the COVID vaccine so quickly. Um, one, of, one of the things they do is it creates synthetic vaccine because until now, or until this technology, the way we would create vaccines is really take a live virus, you know, take a sample of some kind of, uh, you know, organic material with the live virus, and then do all kinds of mutations on it or try to get it to mutate and separate those mutations and then put it them together and see if that mutation can kill that original live virus. And it's kind of trial and error. So that's why the, pol the first polio uh, vaccine was only about 55% effective because they're like, well, it's, you know, it's good enough. Let's, let's release it. And, and they got better and better to 85% to 95% effective. But it was really just trial and error with organic matter. What uh, technology like Synovaxine do is they uh, basically download the entire genetic code of the virus um, and code it and then they do all this trial and error through digital simulation. So they try every different kind of mutation, theoretical mutation on the computer, just through AI millions of times until they find the most effective um, kind of mutation for this virus that can be uh, you know, a good one and, and, and deal with, our, uh, with, with the disease without killing the patient, et cetera. Um, and this really reduced the amount of time and the amount of money it takes to create new vaccines by, you know, 90 something percent. Um, and, um, you know, I, I know these guys, but there, there are a few different companies in the space that are really doing amazing work. We mentioned uh, dengue fever. They are dealing now with dengue fever and, and any kind of orphan, uh, you know, virus, they can, they can help support a vaccine very, very quickly. 
Um, last one is Dumatuk because we talked about food and I really like these guys. Uh, they're also people I work with. So Dumatuk uh, uses a uh, different kind of chemical engineering uh, and material engineering to adjust the molecule of sugar a little bit. Um, and what it does is really when it falls, when the sugar falls on our tongue, uh, our brain analyzes how sweet it is by how quickly that, that, that sugar molecule gets into our tongue. And it's a very tight molecule. Think of like how sugar cubes are, they're all very structured. And so it takes a while till it kind of falls apart and we feel the sweetness. All Duma took, did is find a way to um, kind of shake about that molecule a bit so that you get that sweetness quicker. So your brain thinks that what you're eating has more sugar than what it actually does. Uh, there's no effect, there's no chemical effect, there's no GMO effect, this does nothing in terms of health, it just plays a little bit with our sensory um, ways, and we can reduce the amount of sugar we intake by 50%, just by the fact we play a little bit with how that molecule is structured, um, which of course has a huge effect on, you know, um, diabetes and all the different uh, issues that that sugar has. Uh, yeah, so I'll stop here because I've been talking a long time. Uh, and, and I think these are all very cool, very cool stories. Uh, any kind of things you want to share, Thomas, or questions? No, I, I really like those insights for sure. Absolutely. Um, what, what, um, uh, the, quest, the main question that was coming up for me is that um, all of this, it requires uh, a lot of... Um, research and then it further on requires um very costly uh, certification processes um in in the in the different regulatory environments um and and this is this is usually something that um incumbents can um can pay for mm -hmm. Um, but uh, um, small startups that are more likely to actually disrupt the, the, the way things function um, cannot access so easily. Um, yeah. So, so it comes down to, to um, access of funding for these, um, for these, for these high cost, um, high risk, but also high reward um, uh, scenarios. Um, that's, that, that's, um, might unfold in for a, um, a, a startup in the space of pharma, medicine, health in general. Um, yeah. What do you see there? Is there is, a, is there is there yeah. a move towards? So there's a couple kind of uh, workarounds uh, okay. that I that that exist. Uh, one of them is this issue of like additives uh, versus medicine, right? So you can you can get a certification for an additive quite quickly, much, much deeper, much faster. You, you go through some analysis and, and you do have to be approved by the FDA, but you don't need to be approved uh, through three levels of, of clinical trials and that whole system when, that we have in order to get a uh, medicine into the space. Um, in one way, that is a good thing. On the other hand, that means it's much less regulated. And so um, it also causes a mistrust of the system. And I think the trust issue is one of the key things we, we deal with. Uh, to the point that, you know, with the COVID vaccine, the fact that a lot of the processes were faster because of technology and because the regulatory bodies could work faster again because of technology. The fact that it took a year instead of 10 years, which is what people were expecting, made less people trust the vaccine. Um, so you have this kind of upside down incentive and now you wanna keep it expensive and long so that people trust the system. And, and there are, I've, I've heard of new solutions going like, no, no, we don't, we don't want the quick way, quick route, because it'll seem like we're not legit. So we have this weird kind of feedback loop of the system actually wanting to be faster and more agile, um, but cautious about it because there's a pushback from the public saying, oh, if it's so fast and agile, it's probably not effective or they're probably lying to us. Um, and, you know, 
so for some of us dealing with these COVID arguments across the past two years, you know, some of us got engaged in it, some of us are on this point, some on the other side. It all comes down to that. Can we trust the data? Who are these health systems that are making these decisions? How can we know what they say is true? And it actually is very significant on our ability to live, you know, a healthy life um, and, and not, it, it, it really has a big influence on our, on, our, on our life and even our life expectancy. So there are a lot of conversations uh, in the public sector of what to do and how do you make the data actually much more accessible for the public for them to be more trustworthy. Um, and so what we see, yeah, I, and, and I'm, I know a few initiatives uh, in Israel, which is very much a digital health kind of uh, powerhouse um, and a little bit in the US that are really much more advanced than the health system, uh, like offers much more advancements, but the health system is not ready to take it. Um, which is interesting. Again, we found politics kind of jumping into something that should not be in any way political. Um, and, and, and we have that question. Uh, another workaround is medical devices, medical devices. So anything that, you know, like those uh, point of care diagnostics or any kind of tool we can make in 3D printers also have a shortcut. So they can be online within a year or two. They don't take the 10 years. It's only pharmaceutical that really have this really long, it's expected uh, um, to be a billion dollar process for 10 years to get um, a drug into the market, which is ridiculous, right? That is insane. And while people are dying and we may have a cure uh, and yet it's, it's, it's a big process. And as you say, it's a big blocker. Uh, um, I think uh, in health as an education, there are, kind of ground uh, grassroots movements, kind of bottom-up movements, pushing to decentralize the system as much as possible. Um, but we don't really know how. And here I think we need the thinkers uh, engaged as well. It's not only technology, it's really creating a much more better system. Um, Decentralization will allow quicker and um, more agile and, and locally uh, customized solutions, but we're missing a lot of the of the insights we get by aggregate knowledge, mm. um, that the ability to aggregate solutions, etc. Um, I think it's it's one of those kind of public policy topics that we we look at when we look at you know the good future. We have to find a way to to create cheaper and um, better healthcare. And I think for me is really about teaching people how to get the knowledge. So if we want to be, um, to, you know, bring back the trust in the system, uh, especially when people think it's, it just works for them. Yeah. The whole system just works for pharmaceuticals. And... So, it's, it's, so it seems that um, actually the main blocker is, uh, it, we we know how to reduce the cost um, because we know how to reduce the time for um, approval and clinical trial but um, very similarly to what happened um, when broadcast quality went up that people started um, didn't trust the good signal so you needed to downgrade your signal <laughs> for your reporter who was somewhere on uh, 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 reporting live. So people would actually um, believe that this is a live report um, just because the yeah. technology was faster than the people could catch, catch up with. It looked too clean and neat. Exactly. Yeah. And so, so this, this, this is a similar effect um, of, okay, how is it possible um, one year, um, uh, going down, down to one year from 10, um, where um, this is a very natural progression when you look at the exponential growth curves um, uh, and, and you see doublings um, uh, in, 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 in effect all of the time. Um, so it's, it's, it's to expect that um, the, the time could even um, be, uh, it, it could even become faster. So a yeah. lot of the work has to happen around um, accepting um, and trust, as you say, which has to do with knowledge. 
um, which is um, to me kind of a surprise um, because um, I, I would have thought that um, the issues are more around um, funneling enough money into this. Um, but uh, it doesn't seem like that uh, based on the examples you gave. Yeah, and, and again, this isn't, well, this is what I know. I know that, there, that the systems are, are, are really geared to kind of reducing the cost and the time. And caveat, that's in the Western world, right? Um, what we have, what we mentioned, you know, again and again is about developing countries actually not having that funding at all. Um, and it's, it's funny, it goes back, the Gates Foundation um, uh, was one of the first to kind of incubate uh, an investment fund. It's called the GHIS, uh, Global Health Investment uh, Services, I think, that they, they really, uh, they, they're, it's, it's a proper investment uh, vehicle. They really invest in startups and companies to go through um, the whole process. And they're quite profitable, but they do look at um, the kind of diseases that are either orphan diseases or in, in developing countries that don't reach it, get enough attention. But if you look at them, they are, um, you know, there are enough people who will buy the medicine for it to be a profitable process, even if we don't go into that whole issue of patenting um, medicine and and you know making these very expensive um, medicine for stuff that are not very expensive to produce, to, which is a whole different issue with the industry. Uh, I, I didn't go into the, all the evils of the pharmaceutical industry, with, which needs to change, but I, I think we, we all kind of know that that, 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 that industry is problematic. Um, and, and what we find is that you kind of need impact investors to do that, even though it's profitable and even though it's, um, you know, it makes total sense and, and there's a business case for it and there's whole markets there. You won't see traditional investors going there. It's not the low hanging fruit um, currently. Um, and I, I do think I start seeing a movement of impact investors in the health space going like, okay, let's just expand our focus. Let's look at other additional diseases and they're, they're providing capital there. I think we know a few people who are, who are investing in these solutions too. And so I think you're right, the funding uh, needs to go there. Um, but I think we need just conscious and responsible investors kind of looking around and saying, wait, um, if this is profitable, it makes sense. And there's enough people suffering from this issue, then we can, we can find a business model around it and an impact model around it. Um, and then, and one more thing to remember is we talk about the whole healthcare industry and the pharmaceutical industry as if it's kind of a a free and fair market, but it, it really is like uh, like the oil and gas industry, uh, public sector, kind of government-based uh, sector, right? Um, most healthcare workers are public sector workers. They work for the municipality or the government. Uh, we have um, the majority of innovation and research coming out of academia, of universities and labs funded by governments, um, there is a lot of choice here where the public sector, our governments that we vote for, actually make a huge um, push and, and really influence where this industry goes. So it's not, it's not really a kind of an open industry and that does what, you know, just goes where the money is. It goes where the governments want it to go. Um, and the funding for stuff that have public recognition, public, I mean, public us, the public cares about, um, increases. So if we, you know, if our neighborhood, uh, and, and I don't know, I live in Portugal now, if we all cared about dengue fever, then the, the local government will slowly go like, okay, we should, we should fund research for dengue fever. Um, so there is actually a lot of interaction, especially in the early stages of the, you know, solutions and technology here. Um, that is publicly funded. And it really reflects what we care about. So uh, the more people cared about people dying from lung cancer, uh, the more research was there within tobacco and how oh. we reduce it, including the psychological issues. And the more people care about addiction and narcotics, the more research there is into that and actual solutions to deal with that. And 
so on and so forth. So yeah, so here we here we go again. Um, we need the, the the mind and soul set uh, soul set shift um, to to um, to shift these issues because um, we apparently know how to, um, but um, I think it's um, uh, every three seconds or something like that uh, somebody dies from a preventable cause, um, yeah. and um, so unless we start feeling that and um, attributing value to that uh, in, as opposed to financial value in solving um, hair problems for um, western populations um, we won't we won't um, we won't succeed in this probably and not at scale because of the multi multi-layered uh, complex um, dependencies where um, government makes decisions um, in, in, in super complex decisions. Nobody um, wants to blame them uh, or can blame them directly because they, they need to ensure so many, so many dimensions like um, uh, job security and tax income and all of that, that they um, cannot really act totally freely um, in order to um, to direct uh, regulations in, in in that direction at the moment, so it's it's a it's again a super complex and and that that shows how interconnected all of the all of the SDGs are, um, because um, yeah. <clears throat> in the end, if if there's an, an equal um, signaling power uh, in terms of uh, let's say financial. Um, signaling on the on the planet, then uh, between the people, then um, local governments would 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 feel much more of that pressure very very quickly. Uh, whereas, um, as you said, in, for the the example of dengue, um, that isn't felt, right? That isn't felt That's at true. all. Um, and it and it you cannot know, cannot be made yeah, felt uh, very 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 easily. No, I was I was at the yeah. at the end. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Um, it's funny, I forgot, um, I, I have one more slide, uh, which was, and of course, there's always crypto, right? So uh, cherubs, for instance, and that's just one, um, are kind of saying what you say. So let's, this whole system is so, you know, top down and so led by governments, and they have so many, you know, complex solutions. Uh, let's find a way where we, uh, we as people can decide what we're uh, financing and create um, economic systems based on what we care about. And they're very much engaged in health and in financing solutions that are not public sector uh, finance. Uh, so in all these issues we, we, you know, that we go through, that I can always find like a, a, a cool crypto uh, kind of attempt to solve this problem. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, these guys really are connected with uh, with health and uh, and and financing and community needs. And, and... Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so that's that's a beautiful example where where tech can actually solve um, a systemic issue. And so yeah. we've seen that 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 tech and science actually can solve many of these issues. That um, uh, there's a there's a lock um, coming from existing economic um, and political um, settings um, and that there's a inhibitor um, coming from the knowledge part right so both in um, what I would call salutogenesis uh, so what do I do and what do I don't don't uh, don't do in order to not um, become um, ill but um, also what do I accept Right, and why do I accept it? Mm -hmm. um, and um, it seems to me that um, that solving that first might be um, a strong lever towards um, the, the political arena uh, in order to unleash the, the potential that is there, um, but that um, is under addressed at the moment. Yeah. And, you know, if we just jump one more philosophical kind of level, I'd say. Mm -hmm actually breaking down quantifying understanding and learning 
those two extra additions, the mental health and the well-being. Um, and really trying as a society to maximize them. Not to, mm-hmm. uh, you know, as you say, uh, but but really breaking that down and understanding that and checking ourselves on that and that make, being the paradigm of what we strive for, not, you, mm-hmm. you know, increasing life expectancy, but good life. Um, well, I, I, would, I, would, I would not call that um, <laughs> abstract or philosophical or meta at all. Uh, I mean, just just as a reminder, there was the there's this 50 year old computer model that um, we asked about mm. uh, various scenarios of uh, how the world might pan out based on um, empirical data and the, and the, and the computer model of the world. Um, and we have these scenarios from 1900 to 2100. Um, it's called um, limits to growth. And um, while we can while we can criticize some of those scenarios, um, there's uh, something very interesting happening, which is the standard run, um, which is just business as usual, is very much on track. And we can we can see that in the empirical data of the last 50 years that we are just doing exactly how have been doing for the last 50 years, exactly what that model predicts. Mm-hmm. Now, yeah. there's a different, that, that model, by the way, predicts um, unnecessary deaths in the in this in the in the in the area of four billion people in the second half of the century right so that's not something to take lightly or where we want to yeah. go um, and yeah. but there's another scenario called stabilized world which optimizes for exactly what you were, what you were talking about health and education and in that scenario we plateau at about eight billion um, population and we stay there and that is the simple um, change in, in our priorities from profit maximization to um, maximization of health and education, which is exactly the message uh, that I heard you um, bring here. Mm. Right. And, and you know, that's, uh, that, that 1972 model, it's amazing. Um, but I think it still holds that concept of health being prevention of death or prevention of disease and not necessarily the well-being mm-hmm. um which i think if we would add into it would would make those statistics even even higher or even better um because what i was kind of suggesting as a, as a theory is that if we do as societies actually learn how to maximize well-being and, and our mental health and our you know i think a lot of these issues would actually be solved quicker because the decision makers as well are living better lives, are happier with themselves, are more aware. Uh, the people leading companies are better humans, happier humans. Uh, if we all are kind of less in a mistrust and, and stressed world where we go like, well, you know, but these are my profits and I need them now and God knows what will happen in the future. So I will make this decision regardless of the impact on health, on environment or whatever. And I have, you know, empathy for the, those people. Like they, they live in a world of uncertainty uh, and alert, a world of, of mistrust and they're making rational decisions. I think if we make, make the world focus on really thriving individuals and teaching people how to recognize when they're happy, when they aren't happy, what makes them happy, which a lot of it will be community and empathy. And these are the kind of things that make humans happy, mm-hmm. connections and bonds. Uh, and seeing other people happy, um, if we start really integrating that, I, I would say the kind of philosophical thing would that be that a lot of these things will change, um, including uh, how long it takes to approve issues. Like we don't necessarily need to create a new financial system and use crypto. Uh, we could still use money, our regular stupid paper money, um, if our state of mind and, and what we're trying to optimize for is just better, happier behavior. And we understand more about what it means to have mental health, mm-hmm. not only lack of disease, but being mentally healthy. It's a concept that we still don't really know what it is. Um, and I'd encourage anyone who listens or, or you uh, to hear a, a great podcast uh, uh, of uh, called, in, in, uh, On Being, uh, where she interviews the Surgeon General of the United States, um, 
quite recently, so I think it's like November 2021, post COVID or in the midst of COVID. Um, and him as an individual is really focusing to um, become a better and happier human and focus on well being and, and mental health. And as a Surgeon General of the United States and really a huge decision maker around the health system of the United States, he's like, we don't have the data. We don't even know what it means to be mentally healthy. Like, what, what, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. We know what it is to be diseased. We don't have any parameters or any indicators or any data on that. Um, and of course, we don't, we don't know what it means. And we, we clearly don't know how to get there. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, they had a fascinating conversation of imagining a world where we do know what that means and we're all pushing there and general practitioners and across the board any healthcare worker knows really someone is is healthy not only if he's sick um mm -hmm. and how different uh our our whole systems will be could be so um it is fascinating how um easy that shift can be um if you look at um, something like Susan Pinker's book, The Village Effect, mm -hmm. where she, where she yeah. looked at uh, the blue zones of the world and then focused in on Sardinia, I think it was Sardinia, um, where um, she could establish that it's not the DNA of the people that make them live longer on average. It is not their food intake. It is not workout, it is not any environmental um, uh, um, issue. But what she found was the only difference was a social contract, intergenerational social contract that you would never be alone, that you would always be supported and that you would always support. So as a younger person, you support older per people. And as a older person, you're always supported, but you also integrate it. You can still um, be of service to your community. And um, and that interlinked with the, um, I would even say the understanding of the interconnectedness of um, our um, space of feeling, space of thoughts, and space of acting, our body, so soul, mind, and body, um, the deep interconnectedness of these three domains, I would say, um, that a good indicator for a healthy mind um, can be also a healthy body. Um, and um, <clears throat> it's just an indicator, not um, nothing more, but mm -hmm. um, um, and also a healthy soul, which is which addresses the, the, the mental mental health crisis, right? So so all three work together. Um, and there is no real money to be made. In, in changing the social contract in such a way and, and eating more in a more healthy way. Um, but as you say, maybe it's not necessary, right? Um, maybe it is um, the wrong area to look for, um, for profit um, in general. Um, maybe it is solvable in itself by making itself a, a, a higher higher goods um, that we can um, solve solve by ourselves as being as just simply yeah. as being humans with each other and humane yeah. okay and I, I think that's uh that's amazing and it's a, a great great point to, to to leave in and and it kind of reminds me like where where we started when I, I kind of mentioned health is you know, we put it on that list of the SDGs as if it's just one of them. But in essence, if you look at human civilization and our the, the way we are today, at least, you know, um, I, I never lived in any other period, uh, but it is, I think, above. So we, you know, sure, equality, we want it, but it's nice to have, and, and money, we want enough, but it's nice to have, but being alive, and being healthy, you know, all the all the idioms of, you know, at least you got your health, or you know, it is mm -hmm. it is so much more important to us. It's mm -hmm. most, so much more intrinsic. And in many ways, I've seen the health issue bring into um, 
awareness and into action a lot of issues that were not important until they had a health aspect, right? So um, I know a lot of people who didn't really care about the climate issue until they realized there's, there's a health aspect. You know, oh, I'm, I, I'm ingesting micro microplastics. Uh -huh. We have to fight climate change, right? Uh -huh. um, and we see, um, you know, this idea of lockdowns. You know, I remember before the first lockdown, we were like, we're not going to, there's no way there's going to be a global lockdown. This we're a mm -hmm. capitalist society. We care about money. There is no way governments are going to shut down everything mm -hmm. for a health issue, uh, for any issue, right? But health and people dying um, and and the healthcare, you know, crisis that is 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 actually in our agenda in, in our global society. I think the only thing that we care as much as money. Mm -hmm. um, and just like we see that, you know, imagine that high powered CEO that goes to the gym and goes to the, you know, that is starting now to do yoga and mindfulness and um, meditation practices and slowly we'll know that, oh wait, empathy and social connectivity is a way for me to be healthy. They will start practicing that because mm -hmm. that need to be healthy and for my children to be healthy and no one dying, just preventing death is so basic, I think which can drive a lot of solutions of the other SDGs. Um, if we all, and, and you know, just just a thought. So if, if you care about something that nobody cares about, just explain how it's healthier. And yeah, just, just, just as a final note be, to build on, because it, was, it, it, came up, it came up for me while we were talking. Um, when your body is in relaxation response, um, it is uh, your, your thought processes are about, um, or your, your, your capacity for solving problems is increased by 400 percent in in contrast to when you're in in uh, um, fight or flight mode right and most workers are in fight or flight mode right you're you're constantly mm -hmm. under pressure you're not in relaxation response now um the most reliable way to get into relaxation response is to spend time in nature so allowing your employees to spend time in nature will increase their productivity because mm -hmm. they're, they're in relaxation response. So they will, they will be faster in any um, solution. At least that's true for, for, for um, knowledge workers. They will be faster in any um, uh, solution finding. So as, as soon as you identify this as a competitive advantage exactly just imagine um uh, suddenly uh, google is starting um uh, to 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 send their their workers to the forest right yeah and protecting forests and, and uh... protecting forest and protecting the sea and that's etc et so yeah so so this is the, this so is the all general the CEOs direction, out there but... listening yeah <laughs> <laughs> send your send your workers to the forest yeah seriously i mean that's that's measurable and um, okay, so before we go down that rabbit hole, let's close it here <laughs> for today. That was another really fascinating, interesting deep dive. Thank you so much, Lee. Um, Thank you. And um, I'm looking for the next one. Looking forward to the next one. Um, in um, a couple of days, next week, right? Yeah. Twentieth yeah. of April. Okay. Twentieth of April. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.